New signs of aggression in the deepening crisis in Ukraine. Reports of Russian separatists firing into a village, hitting this kindergarten. Children taken by the hands of teachers and quickly evacuated. Now a major shift from President Biden saying that everything is pointing to Russia's preparedness to go into Ukraine within days as threats appear to be at an all-time high. The apparent false flag Russia is leaning on claiming that the U.S. is stoking fears. The Trumps ordered to testify. A judge has ruled that within just a few weeks, the former president and his two oldest children must sit down to answer questions under oath. The investigation into allegations of financial misconduct at the Trump organization as the Trumps attempt to squash the subpoenas. Snow, ice and flooding, all parts of a major storm sweeping across the country. Record breaking snowfall is already causing chaos on the roads in the Midwest. At least 31 states still on alert. The system put pushing into the Northeast overnight. ABC meteorologist Ginger Z is tracking and timing it all out. The wait to cross a bridge toward hopefully a brighter future. Trust me, it's hard. Please keep us in mind because there are a lot of families suffering and the kids are the most vulnerable. Tonight, ABC News Live takes you inside a growing encampment for migrants, forced to stay while their cases are heard to cross into the United States. Moving into a new phase of the pandemic, more states are dropping mask mandates as the pressure builds for school boards across the country to do the same. Dr. Fauci weighs in on whether your children should be maskless in the classroom. And bringing body positivity to the forefront of social media. Hear from the TikTok star joining one of the biggest clothing brands in the world to help shoppers find clothes that make them feel confident and comfortable. I've, you know, felt this frustration my whole life shopping and it, it just shouldn't be a difficult thing for anyone. It should be easy and it should be fun. And good evening, everyone. I'm Phil Lipoff in tonight for Lindsey Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. For days now, President Biden has held out hope for a diplomatic solution with Russia over Ukraine. But it appears that that hope is dwindling tonight. We begin with a stark new warning from the president saying, quote, every indicator the government has is that Russia is prepared to invade Ukraine. What we know tonight is that despite Russia's claims to the contrary, the U.S. and NATO allies say there has been no pullback of troops. In fact, Russia has continued to build up troops close to the border. U.S. intelligence officials have repeatedly warned if these troops were to go into Ukraine, the pretext would likely be a false flag operation. And today, there's worry about just that after reports of a kindergarten shelled in a Ukrainian village. And there are new reports tonight of additional shellings. Ukraine says Russian-backed separatists are responsible. Russia blamed Ukrainian troops, but the facts don't appear to be on their side. Fears tonight that this alleged attack coupled with an earlier unfair founded claim of a mass grave could give President Putin the reason he may be looking for to invade. ABC News Live anchor Terry Moran leads us off from Ukraine. Tonight, a grim warning from President Biden that the risk of Russia invading Ukraine is, quote, very high. My chance this will happen in the next several days. Biden said Russia has been moving more forces in, not out of areas surrounding Ukraine, as the Kremlin claims, and that Vladimir Putin is trying to create a pretext for an attack. We have reason to believe that they are engaged in a false flag operation. They have an excuse to go in. That false flag warning comes after the shelling of a village in eastern Ukraine overnight. These images, say Ukrainian authorities, show children being led away from a local kindergarten that was hit. No children were injured. Ukraine blamed the artillery assault on separatist forces armed and supported by Russia. The U.S. worries that escalation in the long, simmering conflict in eastern Ukraine could also be exploited by Russia as a reason to strike. The dramatic developments forced U.S. Secretary of State Blinken to delay a trip to Europe this morning so he could make a rare address at the United Nations first. He laid out the peril of what he said Putin might do. Russian missiles and bombs will drop across Ukraine. Communications will be jammed. Cyber attacks will shut down key Ukrainian institutions. After that, Russian tanks and soldiers will advance on key targets that have already been identified and mapped out in detailed plans. Blinken acknowledged that many may doubt U.S. intelligence after the Iraq war, but he added, I am here today not to start a war, but to prevent one. Blinken urged a diplomatic solution and asked Russia for a pledge not to invade, which did not come, though Russia has said in the past it has no plans to attack. 
This morning, we went to a bomb shelter beneath an apartment building here. And this is a blast wall? And while Oksana Hadil, a mom of two who manages many buildings for the city, showed us around, the reality of it all hit her. Could you imagine that this might actually be used in war, this shelter? No, she says, adding, I never could have imagined there could be a war. It's scary. The reality setting in there. Terry joins me now from Ukraine. Terry, has the mood shifted among the Ukrainian people in your time there as this threat from Russia still looms? It really has, Phil, and it's been remarkable. You know, the Ukrainian government was singing a very different tune as it were just a couple of weeks ago, saying that this was all an information war. From them all the way to the ordinary citizens like the woman we just talked to there, you do see a shift in tone, sense of a, a tighter focus on what's happening. In those two weeks I've been here now, the Ukrainians have gone from real skepticism that anything was going to happen to kind of disbelief that, that it might. And now, as you hear, to fear that, that it will. Go. All right. Tara Moran from Ukraine. Thank you. Mary Bruce joins us now from the White House. Mary, what are you hearing led to this new sense of urgency from the White House? Well, Phil, we know the president has been being briefed constantly on any updates and the latest U.S. intelligence. So he has been hearing these uh, reports and seeing the fact that Russia is increasing its troop presence on the border and it seems looking for an excuse to invade. And Mary, how is Russia responding to the U.S. tonight? Well, Russia sent this 11-page letter today, and in it, they seem to make clear they are not interested in de-escalation or compromise. Instead, they are reasserting their hardline demands, insisting that Ukraine never be allowed to join NATO and that allied forces pull back from Eastern Europe. And if these demands are not met, well, the Russians say in this letter they will be forced to take unspecified, quote, military technical measures. Now, Secretary of State Blinken today invited his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, to meet again next week, and Blinken is adamant that there is still room here for diplomacy. But right now, with Putin digging in like this, Phil, it's really hard to see where exactly that room is. All right, Mary Bruce from the White House, thank you. And let's break this down a little bit further for more on the potential threat of a Russian invasion of Ukraine. Let's bring in ABC News contributor and retired General Robert Abrams, who commanded U.S. forces in Korea. General Abrams, thanks so much for your time. You heard President Biden Phil, thanks for having me. It's good to have you here. You heard President Biden warn of a very high risk of a Russian invasion of Ukraine. He says in just a matter of days. From what you're seeing of Russian movements and activity, where would you put the likelihood of invasion now in the coming days? Phil, Phil I think the, the easiest way to say it is that Russia has all the pieces in place right now, today. He's got everything he needs. I think what we're seeing playing out is the Russian forces and Putin are looking to sort of find some way to achieve some sort of tactical uh, overmatch uh, using deception and other things. Uh, but he's got all the pieces in place, so we, we should be ready any day. And I know it's really impossible to get into anyone's head, Vladimir Putin in included, but how real do you think this threat is? I mean, we've been talking for days about a potential bluff to try to force uh, Ukraine in the West to give him security guarantees he's been looking for, most likely and most important for him, for Ukraine not joining NATO. Is this a bluff or not? Phil, this is not a bluff. This is real. And I believe that Vladimir Putin and Russia are going to continue to turn the screws down on Ukraine and the Ukrainian people to include killing Ukrainians uh, as required, as we saw in the shelling today near that elementary school, until he get what he wants. And he's going to continue to coerce them. So we should expect to see steady escalation using a variety of means and capabilities, but this is not a bluff. All right, and, and thinking that way and being a general, it's great we have you here. We want to want to get your uh, opinion on a possible path of invasion that, that Russia would have if they were to go into Ukraine. Here's the map. Can you explain what those would be as far as moving into the country with conventional Russian forces? Sure. So as you can see, the Russian forces, the way they're arrayed, it, it presents multiple options for the army uh, commander on the ground, uh, the ground force commander. And he, he's got the options to be able to attack from multiple directions simultaneously or sequentially. He could use uh, one path, uh, for example, coming from the south using a combination of amphibious operations and attack from Crimea. 
while other directions are conducting what we call a fixing attack or a limited attack just to pin down Ukrainian forces so that they can achieve a penetration in one sector or another. So I think what we've seen here with the array of the Russian forces is Putin has preserved as many options as possible. And again, like I said earlier, he, he's going to look to try to achieve tactical surprise somewhere. He doesn't have the raw numbers in the aggregate. He's going to look where he can achieve decisive massing of his forces, where he has an overwhelming attacker to defender ratio, say in the neighborhood of four or five to one. And that's where we can expect some sort of object, or limited objective attack into Ukraine. What about a path that we don't see on that map? Explain what it would look like, <laughs> including the threat of cyber attacks to destabilize Ukraine. Yeah, so we look, we've been watching uh, Russian cyber operations, you know, for the last three or four weeks. And they, that's, you know, he's got unfettered access. He's demonstrated capability. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, additional things that they could do to Ukraine. I, I think one big thing that's missing, um, well, there's a couple of big things missing from those maps, so it's hard to visualize for your listeners. But, but one of them is the use of Russian special forces, spetsnaz. So these are highly trained. Uh, this is the cream of their crop. Um, they're very, very good at what they do. So we could see potentially a spetsnaz insertion under cover of darkness into key cities like Kiev under the cover of darkness and a limited cyber attack that took out the power grid aided by Russian agents already on the ground to attack key infrastructure. And again, this would be a, a limited objective, again, intended to drive more uncertainty in the Ukrainian people, make them question their resolve uh, and completely undermine their government and again, all back to achieving Putin's objective, which is a commitment, a written commitment that Ukraine can never join NATO. So I think, and, and by the way, that special operation could be conducted in conjunction, in parallel with one of those conventional attacks. So he's got a number of options available to him um, to be able to continue to turn the screws down on Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. Any of this, as you described, General, would be devastating to Ukraine. So this is the question we ask every day when we talk about this. Do you see a diplomatic path out of this, or have things now escalated with the shelling we're hearing about too far? Well, I, I think there's always a, a diplomatic outcome until until the first major shots are fired. So we, we should not give up hope. We should not give up energy, effort. Um, and not just the United States, but the international community as a whole and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, everyone should be working full court press to find a diplomatic solution or some sort of off ramp by which Russia is somehow, some way, you know, satiated their need, their, their so called security concerns. And at the same time, time we've preserved Ukraine and protected the Ukrainian people. So I, I think there's still room for diplomacy. It, we're, we're not at the end of it yet, but it's going to require everyone to give way together in the international community to be able to get us to an off ramp. Retired General Robert Abrams, we really do appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for the expertise tonight. Absolutely. Thank you. Former President Trump is facing a new legal setback tonight after a judge in New York ordered him and his children, Don Jr. and Ivanka, to answer questions under oath in the investigation of the family business. ABC News Chief Washington correspondent Jonathan Carl has details for us. Today, a judge in New York ruled that former President Trump and two of his children, Donald Trump Jr. and Ivanka, must testify under oath within 21 days as part of the state investigation into the family's business practices. I was a business guy. I was successful. I was very successful. New York Attorney General Letitia James is investigating whether Trump illegally misstated the value of his assets to get more favorable loans and to avoid paying taxes. I spend millions of dollars a year for lawyers and for accountants to do my taxes. 
I mean, they do a great job. But just days ago, the Trumps were dropped by their longtime accounting firm, Mazars USA, which said a decade of financial statements compiled with information provided by the Trump organization, quote, should no longer be relied upon. But just because the Trumps have now been ordered to testify doesn't mean they'll have much to say. When Eric Trump was deposed two years ago as part of this same investigation, he invoked his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination more than 500 times. The judge gave the Trumps 21 days to provide their sworn deposition, but first, Trump's lawyers said they plan to appeal. They have the right to an automatic appeal, uh, but the Trumps have had very little luck appealing similar cases in the New York courts. Phil? Our thanks to John for that. Now to that massive winter storm making its way across the country tonight. More than 180 million Americans on alert for snow, ice, flooding, wind, possibly tornadoes. Whiteout conditions today in Wichita, Kansas, as tonight this storm is making its way east. Let's bring in ABC chief meteorologist Ginger Z, who is tracking this monster storm. Ginger, good evening. Good evening to you, Phil. You know, Kansas City, Missouri has had more than seven inches of snow just today. That's more in a single day than they've had in eight years. So this is a significant snowstorm from there up through south of Chicago, but Chicago's still getting snow tonight. Northwest Indiana, like Valparaiso or Fort Wayne, right into southwest Michigan and over to Detroit. That's the snowy side, but there is a flood issue. There's even an ice jam break in, on the Kankakee River south of Chicago. In that band of snow, you have a flash flood warning, something you don't see every day. And there we have a tornado warning along that line and that large area in the tornado watch from northern Alabama back through southern Mississippi. If you're in North Georgia or eastern Tennessee, you're going to have very strong storms. Just because you don't have a watch yet doesn't mean you don't want to be on the lookout and have your ways of getting warning. Now, it will be heavy rain. There's a flood threat really strong winds with this, but as the low moves into the northeast, it's tomorrow morning when you should not be surprised that you could wake up to thunder and lightning, yes, here in New York City even, and you're going to have the chance to get gusts anywhere from 45 to, say, 65 miles per hour. So it's going to be a ruckus kickoff to the weekend, Phil. A little bit of everything. Ginger, thanks so much. Let's turn now to the fight against COVID. 49 states have lifted or plan to lift indoor mask mandates today. California, New Mexico, Washington State made those announcements. But health experts say as we take mask coverings off, we should be prepared to put them back on if another variant emerges. ABC's chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, with the details. With COVID cases nosediving tonight, all but one state announcing they'll drop mask mandates. Hallelujah. I'm very tired of this on again, off again with mess. New Mexico and Washington State today making their moves, leaving just Hawaii and Puerto Rico without plans to end masks indoors. And the country's most populous state, California, today rolling out its roadmap to ramp up or down restrictions if and when the virus resurges. But over the next few weeks, it's reasonable to take off masks indoors, take off masks in schools. Uh, and CDC guidance on that will be helpful. I think we're also going to get guidance that says that in future surges, or so if we have other variants, I will maybe need to put masks back on. And pressure is mounting on school boards to lift mask mandates for kids. I'm, I'm begging you to please make masking optional. No, 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 no. Nearly 47 million children remain unvaccinated, and 97% of the country still seeing high transmission. Dr. Anthony Fauci says it's time to start inching back toward normal life, but he believes it's too soon to lift mask mandates in schools. You really got to be careful. You know, you don't want to say it's an absolutely wrong decision. It's understandable why people want to take masks off the kids. But right now, given the level of activity that we have, it is risky. That from Dr. Fauci tonight. Matt joins us now. Matt, the CDC is expected to update its mask guidance as early as next week. But what's the big question surrounding the change? what the CDC plans to do about schools, whether it plans to uh, change or update its guidelines on masks in schools. So far, CDC officials have been insistent that masks work to keep schools open, which obviously is the ultimate goal, Phil. And that the governor of California today announcing some pretty big changes with how California is going to handle this pandemic moving forward, right? 
Right. I mean, he, he's going from calling this a pandemic to saying that California is going to be the first in the nation to call it something, a virus that is endemic. Uh, he basically said, uh, quote, the pandemic won't have a defined end. There is no finish line, which is why he says the state is moving away from mandates and towards managing this, i.e., this is not going to be something that uh, they can stamp out, but something that we all simply have to live with. Phil. We'll see if other states follow. Matt Gutman, thanks so much. And when we come back, the investigation into more than 400,000 Teslas about a pretty serious issue some are calling phantom braking. Our in-depth look at the watchdog organization Safe Sport, created to investigate allegations of abuse and misconduct impacting, impacting Olympic athletes. But is it doing enough to keep them safe? But up next, our team on the border giving us an update on the situation there. And what they found is, frankly, a system that's a mess. Stay with us. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now, with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pow. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. Breaking news overnight. Your money and concerns about inflation. The pandemic is not over. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was gonna say. And what to expect in the day ahead. From the top of the world, baby! ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Weekday morning starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 7 there for you with one touch the abc news app download it now she was Diva. drama money and fame shaw amazing the prime housewife then suddenly we've seen a lot of things on the real housewives but we've never seen anyone be arrested unpredictable rich woman sign me up Mommy. this is what being live is Three all about this is abc news live all right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people this squeezing into this bomb shelter. Run, urgent delivery, run with Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back. We want to go now to our nation's southern border, where migrants continue to arrive in the hope of building a life here in our country. And while President Trump's term has long ended, his immigration policies, specifically Title 42 and Migrant Protection Protocols, known as MPP, continue under President Biden. But as our Maria Villarreal exclusively learned, things may soon change whether or not our Border Patrol agents are ready. This is the bridge that connects Hidalgo, Texas, to Reynosa, Mexico. Over the last year, it's become a path of uncertainty and fear for so many families, a stark symbol of a fractured immigration system. Less than a block from the bridge in Reynosa is a growing encampment. More than 2,200 migrants corralled into a small plaza 
thanks in large part to Title 42, a U.S. policy that allows Border Patrol to immediately remove migrants seeking asylum due to health concerns related to the pandemic. It's easy for visitors like us to get lost in the sea of tents, clothes hanging everywhere, trash piling up, cooking is nearly impossible. So meals are often donated by churches in the U.S. But hidden among the chaos is a small slice of normalcy. We've blurred the faces of these children for their protection. So this is the sidewalk school. I just got here. Hi. 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 The Sidewalk School is an American nonprofit organization that runs solely on donations. We had to go at a very rapid pace. We, we do fund the food that goes in that camp, the socks, the clothing. That's the Sidewalk School. In there? In there. They don't know it, and that's how we like to keep it. Uh, it's just things are safer for Victor and I that way. So the partners we have, the pastors who live here, the, the shelter directors who live here, you see them give out everything, which is great. You just don't know where it comes from, but it's us. There are three classes a day filled with up to 40 students from a lot of different countries. Honduras. Yeah. Oh, bastante. ¿Quién está en Guatemala? Okay, no, I was in the water. Um, hmm. Uh, El, El Salvador? Oh. De dónde? De aquí, de México. ¿Quién está en México? México? De Haiti. De Haiti. Oh, hola, Henry. Felicia Rangel Sampanato watches the camp grow every day. It's clear to me right now in the U.S. that people seem to think this problem has quieted. How is that perception different from reality? It never stopped under Biden. Nothing's changed. Children are still sent across unaccompanied. And let me say, this is only to minority asylum seekers. There are no white asylum seekers in this camp. And that's what people should be asking. Why is it different for white asylum seekers? Why is it only brown and black people you see living in dirt 24-7? Now for almost a year. A few miles from the plaza along the riverbank, Pastor Hector runs the Senda de Vida shelter. So most of the families are, are going to be people who have already crossed and come back. That's right. Yeah, and yeah. they don't have any more money. They ran out. Global response management helps with the medical needs. And more than half of their patients right now are from Haiti, one of the top countries of origin for black immigrants in the U.S. The country has been rattled by civil unrest and natural disasters in recent years. We're seeing an increase in Haitian migration. Like Senda was built by my pastor and whoever he works with as a more of a safe haven. But La Plaza, it is it feels like a free fall sometimes. So this is just one of two shelters in Reynosa, Mexico. There are more than 1,100 people here right now. And yet every day this place continues to grow as more people are sent back from the U.S. What are you looking for right now, though? These footprints is what we're looking for. On the U.S. side of the border, it's just as busy for federal agents. We followed along as they patrolled near the border wall. What do we know? Countries of origin, roughly? Uh, three El Salvadorans and a few Mex. And oh. uh, what stands out a little bit is that those two individuals right there, 19-year-old, that they're from Reynosa, which is a border town in Mexico right across the, the, the river. So it's just after uh, 7, 7 in the morning, sun is just coming up. Uh, we've been with Border Patrol for a few hours now. Uh, this is probably our fourth or fifth stop. All of the guys caught in this group were previously caught a few days ago. This past December alone, there were over 78,000 Title 42 expulsions at the southwest border. But the Border Patrol's top leader, Chief Raul Ortiz, spoke to me exclusively and says he's telling his agents to prepare for possible changes. Are you in on the conversations about Title 42 and changing it, ending it? I'm not a policy maker. Uh, I do provide counsel when I'm asked, but uh, I really can't get, be focused on that as much as making sure that the men and women have the resources that they need out here. I know I don't have enough agents. I know I don't have enough equipment. And then I know I need to close some gates and gaps. That will put us in a better position for success. Last year, the Supreme Court blocked the Biden administration's attempt to terminate the migrant protection protocols, so the government has been gradually rolling it out again. So what you're seeing is hope that Biden 
Biden takes away Title 42, which he can at any second if he chooses to. So you're talking about people hoping that Title 42 goes away, so at least they have a chance to claim, make a claim of asylum. That's what you're looking at out here. For now, families willingly wait here because they say going back to their home countries just isn't an option. Trust me, it's hard. Please keep us in mind because there are a lot of families suffering and the kids are the most vulnerable. Maria, thank you for that. Still ahead, a verdict in the trial against the man accused of providing the drugs that killed this promising young Angels pitcher. Florida lawmakers pushing forward a new abortion bill that has some up in arms tonight. What could an invasion into Ukraine cost Russia and the U.S. economy? We're going to take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day from Peanuts on this random act of kindness day. time anytime nightline the straightforward facts abc news is america's number one news good morning america number one in the morning nine years running world news tonight with david muir number one in the evening with america's most watched newscast 2020 the number one news magazine on friday nights nightline number one in late night versus the competition the view the number one daytime talk show and abc news live number one in streaming news abc news is america's number one news it was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime. 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. is what being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Okay. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us.
Welcome back, everyone. President Biden today gave his most dire warning yet about a possible Russian invasion of Ukraine. And tonight, the most likely and immediate economic impacts if this happens and if sanctions are imposed, we're going to take a look by the numbers. The S&P 500 tumbled more than 2% today, while the tech-heavy Nasdaq plunged nearly 3%. European financial markets are also dropping, and these market jitters could worsen. Also, U.S. gas prices would almost certainly rise if there is an invasion, at least temporarily. Gas Buddy predicts a one and a half cents a gallon increase to the national average gas price if there is even a limited Russian incursion into Ukraine. Energy prices and volatility would likely spike even higher in the European Union, which relies, as we know, heavily on Russia for more than one third of its natural gas imports. U.S. inflation is already at a 40 year high and could go even higher with surging energy prices. But the economic impact on Russia would almost certainly be much more devastating. It's worth noting that the U.S. economy is more than 14 times the size of Russia's economy. We still have a lot to get to here on Prime. The day of drama at the Olympics. The Russian skater allowed to compete after testing positive for a banned substance. She was expected to win her event today. She didn't. So what happens next? The charity being led by Prince Charles getting investigated. We'll have details on that. And the social media star preaching inclusivity in fashion. It's this week's TikTok. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pow. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Christopher Steele, the guy who picked a fight with two presidents, and he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier, supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed, and would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. I said, take out the PP tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. <laughs> the story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. Now, with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. Now.
now with so much hope for a brighter tomorrow filled with sunshine. It's time to rise and shine. And we're celebrating by hitting the road. Let's, Let's do it. it. Traveling all across the country. Oh my God. Rise and shine. Rise and shine. <laughs> <laughs> Let us shine. Let us shine. Let shine. Let shine. Yes, it's time to celebrate and smile with Good Morning America's Great Rise and Shine Tour. In a last-minute presentation at the U.N. Security Council meeting, Secretary of State Antony Blinken sharing America's view of what Vladimir Putin plans to do with the 150,000 Russian troops he's assembled near Ukraine's border. Our information indicates clearly that these forces are preparing to launch an attack against Ukraine in the coming days. The top U.S. diplomat saying the Russian invasion would involve bombs raining down across Ukraine, communication lines across the country being jammed, cyber attacks crashing key networks while Russian soldiers and tanks move on specific targets, including Ukraine's capital, Kyiv. Putin insisting he has no intentions of invading Ukraine, accusing the U.S. of hysteria. <laughs> they have not moved any of their troops out. They've moved more troops in. In a party line vote, the Florida House has passed a bill that would put new restrictions on abortion. It heads to the state Senate next. This has been highly debated in Florida, and this bill mirrors Mississippi's ban, which the Supreme Court will soon decide on. As lawmakers discussed it, protesters charging in, speaking out against the measure. The GOP-controlled House advancing the bill, which limits abortions after 15 weeks. Democrats were unable to get exceptions for pregnancies caused by rape, incest, or human trafficking, but there are exceptions if it's necessary to save the mother's life, to prevent serious injury, or if the fetus has an abnormality. A jury in Texas has convicted a former Los Angeles Angels employee of providing the drugs that killed pitcher Tyler Skaggs. Eric Kay was the LA Angels public relations contact on many trips. Prosecutors said he gave pitcher Tyler Skaggs the drugs that killed him while they were on the road in Texas in 2019. Skaggs had a mix of alcohol, fentanyl, and oxycodone in his body when he choked on his own vomit. Kay could get life in prison. London police launching an investigation into Prince Charles's charity after allegations of corruption. Metropolitan Police confirming the investigation concerns alleged attempts to secure royal honors and citizenship for a Saudi national in exchange for a large donation to the Prince's foundation. So far, no arrests have been made. Charles is the president of the foundation, but does not oversee its day-to-day -day affairs. The foundation cooperating with police turning over documents to investigators after its own independent investigation last year found former chief executive and Prince Charles's personal valet Michael Fawcett did coordinate with fixers in an attempt to secure a knighthood for the wealthy donor. An investigation has begun into more than 400,000 Teslas over reports of phantom braking. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is looking into 2021 and 2022 Tesla Model 3 and Model Y vehicles. NHTSA received 354 complaints that allege that the vehicle unexpectedly applies its brakes while driving at highway speeds while using the autopilot function. The complaints also said deceleration can occur without warning at random and often repeatedly. A historic first for Victoria's Secret, Sophia Giroux will join the fashion brand as its first model with Down syndrome. The 24-year-old Puerto Rican model announcing the news on Instagram Monday saying, one day I dreamed of it, I worked on it, and today it's a dream come true. She will join Victoria's Secret's Love Cloud campaign along with 17 other women of different backgrounds. Now to an ABC News ESPN investigation of how allegations of abuse and misconduct are handled in the Olympic sports world here in the U.S. by an independent watchdog organization called the Center for Safe Sport. Critics say the five-year-old organization must do more to gain the trust of the very athletes it's meant to protect, like former Taekwondo champion Heidi Gilbert. Here's ABC's David Scott with her story. Heidi Gilbert has always been a fighter. Hey! Starting in the eighth grade, I would get off the school bus, grab a snack, grab my Taekwondo bag, get down to the Taekwondo school, and I would train until around 9 o'clock at night. From a young age, she dreamed of competing on the world stage. All I wanted to do 
was win the Olympics. Her hard work began to pay off when, at 16, Heidi started training with the national team under the watchful eye of coach Jean Lopez. Jean Lopez, United States Olympic coach for the sport of Taekwondo. At 20, Heidi won a gold medal at the 2002 Pan American Games in Ecuador, a giant step towards making her Olympic dreams a reality. But then, Heidi says she found herself alone with Lopez in his hotel room after the competition. He like threw me on the bed and then kind of like jumped on top of me. And then he came behind me and dry humped me and ejaculated in his pants. Shocked and struggling to comprehend what she says happened, she initially kept the alleged assault a secret. Since the age of, you know, 11 years old, I'd had this dream of going to the Olympics, and that's what I had been working so hard for. I wasn't willing to jeopardize my chances of winning an Olympic gold medal. But it turned out Heidi was not alone. Over the course of the next decade, Heidi and multiple other women came forward to report similar claims of sexual misconduct against Jean Lopez. Lopez has denied the allegations. The sex abuse scandal in USA Gymnastics was sparking headlines around the world, and there was a growing consensus that sports federations could not be trusted to police themselves. Olympic leaders were forced to take action. Everyone loves a champion. They created the U.S. Center for Safe Sport, a new independent watchdog organization to investigate allegations of abuse and misconduct. Heidi's case would be one of its first big tests. All of this had already cost you your career? Yeah. I had been abused. I had all my dreams had been crushed. According to confidential documents, in 2018, Safe Sports investigators concluded that Jean Lopez had engaged in, quote, a decades-long pattern of sexual misconduct by an older coach abusing his power to groom, manipulate, and sexually abuse younger female athletes. Safe Sport banned Lopez from coaching for life. I felt like we were changing things and we were kind of the trailblazers for sexual misconduct that was happening in our sport. But that feeling was short-lived. Lopez appealed, and the case went into arbitration. Heidi declined to testify at the hearing at the advice of her attorneys, and despite the evidence she provided during Safe Sports' earlier investigation, the arbitrator said they could not assess her credibility and opted to overturn Lopez's ban. As a victim, you're just kind of floundering, right? You're you're out there in the ocean swimming, and you're like, where do I turn? Who do you trust? Who Who is going to hold anyone accountable? Lopez maintained his innocence in an interview with a local Fox TV station following the band's reversal. It was a relief because the whole time we knew, and I knew, that, that I am innocent of of any of the allegations, the, the false accusations that have been made against myself. Safe Sports says such reversals are rare outliers among the hundreds of sanctions they have imposed. An ABC ESPN investigation found that nearly half of those who have appealed their sanctions see them reduced or removed. Safe Sports spokesman Dan Hill suggested that attorneys with a financial incentive to pursue cases in the civil courts have been, quote, recklessly undermining the mission of the center. Senators Richard Blumenthal and Jerry Moran spearheaded legislation signed by President Trump in 2020 designed to strengthen safe sport. No athlete, whether an amateur athlete or an Olympian, should have to endure abuse and mistreatment to pursue the sport they love. When we spoke to them, they expressed serious concerns about its effectiveness. There is simply no way that safe sports can be given a passing grade for how it has acted in the past. Every athlete we visited with, every victim, had little or no faith in space, uh, safe sport. They believe more transparency is needed to protect young athletes. The U.S. Center for Safe Sports cannot do its job, simply cannot do its job unless it uh, makes its work public. Safe Sports CEO Juris Colon initially agreed to an on-camera interview with ABC News and ESPN, but ultimately declined to speak with us.
Safe Sports spokesmen responded to a series of questions via email and phone calls, defending the organization's track record, touting hundreds of sanctions imposed to date, and saying the center is, quote, motivated to earn the trust of athletes and their advocates. It is a first-of-its-kind organization in the world, and it's four years in and taking on a massive challenge. There are growing pains, but the fact of the matter is it's an incredible success story. Safe Sports doesn't have my confidence and trust right now, but it can if it shows results. I think the jury's still out. Sixteen-year-old Taekwondo competitor comes to you and says something happened can I trust safe sport with my story what do you tell her I would recommend getting a lawyer and filing a police report 1998 Heidi did hire a lawyer and sued Lopez and USA Taekwondo along with several other women in 2018 She now coaches here in Seattle. And she's no longer affiliated with the Federation. Recently, she got some big news. USA Taekwondo settled their lawsuit with no admission of wrongdoing for millions of dollars. Now comes the healing, right? Where us as victims, we can actually get the help that we need to be able to heal from what happened to us. Feel vindicated? Yeah. Ah, there you go. Lopez is free to continue coaching and remains active in the sport in Southern California. David, thank you. A dramatic conclusion to an Olympic event clouded by controversy. 15-year-old Camilla Valieva, the Russian ice skater allowed to compete after testing positive for a banned substance, placed fourth in the event she was expected to win. Valieva fell several times during her single performance and was seen crying afterwards. Before she took the ice, Team USA members sitting in the arena got up and walked out. We want to now turn to our weekly segment, TikTok, where we interview some of our favorite TikTokers, taking a closer look at the story behind the sensation. Our next guest is Remy Jo Bader, known on TikTok as the Realistic Clothing Hall Queen. Remy uses her platform to promote body inclusivity and mental health awareness to her more than 2 million followers. Remy Jo joins us now. Hey, thanks for taking the time. We really do appreciate it. Of course, how are you? I'm good, thanks. It's great to speak with you because this afternoon I did a deep dive into your into your TikTok and I can't wait to ask you these questions. Your career has really skyrocketed since posting some styling videos and having your own show, partnering with well-known brands. The list goes on and on. What has this been like to you? It sort of happened pretty quickly. Yes, it's been super surreal. I, I started a little bit over a year ago, but it didn't really take off until last January. Um, and yeah, it's been really crazy. Within that time, I gained over 2 million followers. Um, I just announced today that I'm working with Victoria's Secret Pink um, as their brand ambassador and size consultant to help them to expand sizing. Um, it's just been super crazy. The company takes a step toward in inclusivity. This is one of the ways we've seen them do it. Um, what will you be doing in this role and how do you how do you hope to help other shoppers who want to find clothes that make them feel confident and comfortable? Yeah, well, my whole thing is that I've, you know, felt this frustration my whole life shopping, and it, it just shouldn't be a difficult thing for anyone. It should be easy and it should be fun. So um, for me taking this role, I'm going to be helping them expand their sizing further with their intimates and um, loungewear. And um, I also am going to be wear testing some of the clothes before it goes into production to see how the sizing fits and really just helping them with the ins and outs to make it an even better brand than it already is. Out of all the things you're doing, you are known for your candid and honest clothing haul reviews. Let's take a listen. Yeah, yeah I simply think that corduroy and corduroy is the best possible look. I mean, <laughs> the hills are alive with the sound of music for only $168. And don't forget that it comes with this underpiece that fits women of all body types. I think for me, looking at your TikTok, some of your, the humor you use, and it's so on point with the clothing you have. How'd you come up with that concept? 
it's pretty crazy because I didn't really come up with it. I think it just like kind of happened and it's just literally me being me, but I decided to put it um, into make videos. So I think that we all, um, you know, beat ourselves up when it comes to the fashion industry and blame ourselves. But I tried making it a point that like, we can also laugh and we can also not blame ourselves. The clothing industries can be a little messed up and all brands are different. So like, let's just kind of laugh about it and build a community together and figure it out together. I think one of the things you point out is that not everything that we buy online comes out the way we hope, certainly. What brands uh, have you found that are doing it right in terms of size inclusivity? Um, there's a number of brands. I would say that is it always right across the board? No, because everyone's bodies are different. But brands like A Good American was one of the brands, um, which is Khloe Kardashian's brands, who that just started, you know, doing it first and sort of took trendy clothing, but is super inclusive. Abercrombie, who was a brand that wasn't inclusive in the past, is you know really pushing curvy denim. Um, you know, there's there's so many across the board, and 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 every day you hear about a new brand that's launching plus size. I think the goal would be that it's just there's no more plus size or extended size. There's no name for it, and it's just all one thing, all inclusive. I think that every brand is allowed to change, and I would love to be a part of that change with them if they want me to. So. Yeah. Well, and it seems like that's that's happening. Your announcement today with Victoria's Secret, but I'm curious: has a brand ever reached out to you for calling them out in not such a good way? Actually, never. Which is super funny. When I started this in the beginning, I just thought every brand was going to hate me. Like I was just like, okay, I'm, now people are starting to follow me, but the brands are going to hate me. But I did it anyways because the people liked it, and it actually turned into that more of the brands reached out because they wanted me to help them. A lot of your content addresses mental health and body dysmorphia. You're, you're pretty vulnerable on social media. I mean, anybody who opens up like you do, um, that you're not always feeling your best. What's one thing you've learned about yourself in this journey towards self-acceptance that you can maybe share with someone who is not in your place and still struggling? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I tell all my followers again that it's okay to not feel confident every single day. Why should we pretend to love our bodies and ourselves every second? And now I've learned that, like, I just put myself out here when I weigh the most I've ever weighed and people love me for who I am. So I think just, like, you know, looking past that and looking past just your body and, like, finding the good parts of you as a person. So um, that's been a really exciting part for me. Yeah, well, I think you're spectacular, and I share your hope that someday it, it won't be a thing, and it will just be the I sizes agree. that are the sizes, right? Yeah. Well, Remy, we appreciate you taking the time talking to us, and I will continue to follow you on TikTok. Thank you so much. So nice talking to you. Before we go tonight, the image of the day, they call this the snow moon. The name, according to NASA, is indigenous inspired because it was often visible when it snowed a lot. And although this image was captured near a castle in Italy where it doesn't snow that much, it certainly is still beautiful. That's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks so much for streaming with us. And a quick note, stay with ABC News Live tomorrow. 10 a.m. Eastern, we're going to have live coverage of the sentencing of former police officer Kim Potter, convicted in the killing of Dante Wright. Once again, that's tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern, right here on ABC News Live. Coming up in the next hour, we are continuing to monitor the situation in Ukraine and along its borders. Plus, what more can we do to protect children from some of the dangers online? With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. 
This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people. No squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. It was a solemn funeral service in the Minneapolis area for Amir Locke, a 22-year-old black man who was killed by an officer executing a search warrant. Speakers condemned police for the events leading up to Locke's death and brought up some of the other people of color killed during police encounters. Locke's death has provoked an outcry against no-knock warrants, and his family is now trying to have them banned in Minnesota and beyond. A grand jury has issued at least 19 indictments for Austin police officers accused of excessive use of force during protests in 2020, sparked by the murder of George Floyd. That's according to sources close to the matter. Also today, the Austin City Council provided, uh, approved rather, paying a combined $10 million to two people injured when officers fired beanbag rounds into crowds. Masks are no longer required indoors for any vaccinated guests visiting Disney World and Disneyland starting today. All face coverings are optional for the vaccinated, but unvaccinated visitors are still required to wear masks inside. Disney is the parent company of ABC News. We turn to the stark new warning from President Biden today saying every indicator the government has is that Russia is prepared to invade Ukraine. And despite Russia's claims to the contrary, the U.S. and NATO allies say there has been no pullback of troops. Rather, Russia has continued to build up troops close to the border. With new reports of shelling in Ukraine tonight, the world is on edge over what could happen next. ABC News Live anchor Terry Moran has the latest from Ukraine. Tonight, a grim warning from President Biden that the risk of Russia invading Ukraine is, quote, very high. My sense this will happen in the next several days. Biden said Russia has been moving more forces in, not out of areas surrounding Ukraine, as the Kremlin claims, and that Vladimir Putin is trying to create a pretext for an attack. We have reason to believe that they are engaged in a false flag operation to have an excuse to go in. That false flag warning comes after the shelling of a village in eastern Ukraine overnight. These images, say Ukrainian authorities, show children being led away from a local kindergarten that was hit. No children were injured. Ukraine blamed the artillery assault on separatist forces armed and supported by Russia. The U.S. worries that escalation in the long, simmering conflict in eastern Ukraine could also be exploited by Russia as a reason to strike. The dramatic developments forced U.S. Secretary of State Blinken to delay a trip to Europe this morning so he could make a rare address at the United Nations first. He laid out the peril of what he said Putin might do. Russian missiles and bombs will drop across Ukraine. Communications will be jammed. Cyber attacks will shut down key Ukrainian institutions. After that, Russian tanks and soldiers will advance on key targets that have already been identified and mapped out in detailed plans. Blinken acknowledged that many may doubt U.S. intelligence after the Iraq war, but he added, I am here today not to start a war, but to prevent one. Blinken urged a diplomatic solution and asked Russia for a pledge not to invade, which did not come, though Russia has said in the past it has no plans to attack. This morning, we went to a bomb shelter beneath an apartment building here. And this is a blast wall. And while Oksana Hadil, a mom of two who manages many buildings for the city, showed us around, the reality of it all hit her. Could you imagine that this might actually be used in war, this shelter? No, she says, adding, I never could have imagined there could be a war. 
It's scary. The reality setting in there. Terry joins me now from Ukraine. Terry, has the mood shifted among the Ukrainian people in your time there as this threat from Russia still looms? It really has, Phil, and it's been remarkable. You know, the Ukrainian government was singing a very different tune as it were just a couple of weeks ago, saying that this was all an information war. From them all the way to the ordinary citizens like the woman we just talked to there, you do see a shift in tone, sense a, a, a tighter focus on what's happening. In those two weeks I've been here now, the Ukrainians have gone from real skepticism that anything was going to happen to kind of disbelief that, that it might. And now, as you hear, to fear that, that it will. Go. All right. Tara Moran from Ukraine. Thank you. Mary Bruce joins us now from the White House. Mary, what are you hearing led to this new sense of urgency from the White House? Well, Phil, we know the president has been being briefed constantly on any updates and the latest U.S. intelligence. So he has been hearing these uh, reports and seeing the fact that Russia is increasing its troop presence on the border. And it seems looking for an excuse to invade. And Mary, how is Russia responding to the U.S. tonight? Well, Russia sent this 11-page letter today, and in it they seem to make clear they are not interested in de-escalation or compromise. Instead, they are reasserting their hardline demands, insisting that Ukraine never be allowed to join NATO and that allied forces pull back from Eastern Europe. And if these demands are not met, well, the Russians say in this letter they will be forced to take unspecified, quote, military technical measures. Now, Secretary of State Blinken today invited his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, to meet again next week, and Blinken is adamant that there there is still room here for diplomacy. But right now, with Putin digging in like this, Phil, it's really hard to see where exactly that room is. All right, Mary Bruce from the White House, thank you. Meantime, former President Trump is facing a new legal setback tonight after a judge in New York ordered him and his children, Don Jr. and Ivanka, to answer questions under oath in the investigation of the family business. ABC News Chief Washington correspondent Jonathan Carl has details. Today, a judge in New York ruled that former President Trump and two of his children, Donald Trump Jr. and Ivanka, must testify under oath within 21 days as part of the state investigation into the family's business practices. I was a business guy. I was successful. I was very successful. New York Attorney General Letitia James is investigating whether Trump illegally misstated the value of his assets to get more favorable loans and to avoid paying taxes. I spend millions of dollars a year for lawyers and for accountants to do my taxes. I mean, they do a great job. But just days ago, the Trumps were dropped by their longtime accounting firm, Mazars USA, which said a decade of financial statements compiled with information provided by the Trump organization, quote, should no longer be relied upon. But just because the Trumps have now been ordered to testify doesn't mean they'll have much to say. When Eric Trump was deposed two years ago as part of this same investigation, he invoked his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination more than 500 times. The judge gave the Trumps 21 days to provide their sworn deposition, but first, Trump's lawyers said they plan to appeal. They have the right to an automatic appeal, uh, but the Trumps have had very little luck appealing similar cases in the New York courts. Phil? Jonathan, thank you. And we should mention that former President Trump responded tonight in part saying there is no case here. Now to that massive winter storm making its way across the country tonight. More than 180 million Americans on alert for snow, ice, flooding, wind, possible tornadoes. Victor Akendo with more. Tonight, that sprawling late winter storm wreaking havoc across the heartland. Wind whipped snow causing whiteout conditions, visibility near zero. Watch as this pickup truck fishtails on a Wichita, Kansas roadway, struggling for traction. Multiple Kansas City Highway Patrol vehicles struck. Both troopers are okay. They're urging people to stay off the roads. On Interstate 39, north of Bloomington, Illinois, reports of a mass collision several hundred yards long, involving as many as 100 vehicles. On the warm side of the storm, torrential rain and the threat of tornadoes. Sirens sounding in northwest Alabama. If you're in any of these places we're calling out, you've got to be in a safe place now. Wear a helmet if you can. Victor, thank you. And now let's bring in Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z, who is tracking this massive storm. Ginger. 
Good evening to you, Phil. You know, Kansas City, Missouri has had more than seven inches of snow just today. That's more in a single day than they've had in eight years. So this is a significant snowstorm from there up through south of Chicago, but Chicago's still getting snow tonight. Northwest Indiana, like Valparaiso or Fort Wayne, right into southwest Michigan and over to Detroit. That's the snowy side, but there is a flood issue. There's even an ice jam break in, on the Kankakee River south of Chicago in that band of snow. You have a flash flood warning, something you don't see every day. And there we have a tornado warning along that line and that large area in the tornado watch from northern Alabama back through southern Mississippi. If you're in North Georgia or eastern Tennessee, you're going to have very strong storms. Just because you don't have a watch yet doesn't mean you don't want to be on the lookout and have your ways of getting warning. Now, it will be heavy rain. There's a flood threat really strong winds with this, but as the low moves into the northeast, it's tomorrow morning when you should not be surprised that you could wake up to thunder and lightning. Yes, here in New York City even. And you're going to have the chance to get gusts anywhere from 45 to say 65 miles per hour. So it's going to be a ruckus kickoff to the weekend, Phil. A little bit of everything. Ginger, thanks so much. Children and their digital safety has been a growing concern. Any parent would know that. Now two senators are introducing a sweeping bill to help protect kids online. And one momfluencer is raising an alarm about what can happen when parents post photos on social media. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. Two senators introducing the Kids Online Safety Act, a new bill designed to help mitigate the potentially harmful effects of social media on its youngest users. We're requiring the social media tech platforms to give option to children and their parents pr to protect their information, to disable addictive features, and to opt out of the algorithm recommendation that often involve driving toxic content to kids. Meta telling ABC News they've put several safety measures in place already and next month plan to roll out parental tools to help set time limits on their apps. Katie Rose Pritchard started her Instagram page four years ago to highlight her motherhood journey, all while collaborating with brands and sharing photos of her four children to her nearly 100,000 followers. So I would model their clothing or products, even with my children, promoting their brands on my account. Pritchard says she didn't think much of posting pictures of her kids, but that all changed last December when she discovered their images had been stolen and used to create fake accounts. They had given us new identities, new names, an entire storyline, essentially pretending playing like they were us. It's called role playing and it's one of the more sinister sides of social media that Joe Piazza says she uncovered for her hit podcast under the influence. This is a place where sexual predators can tend to thrive because they're playing with fictional identities of very, very real children. Pritchard says she reported the fake images to Instagram. Then she wiped all of the images showing her kids' faces off her personal page. Now she only shows photos of her kids without their faces. I will never know where all of their photos end up. I'll never know what they were really used for. Instagram's parent company, Meta, telling ABC News, we remove accounts that impersonate others or use their content without permission, and we remove the accounts involved in this case. Parents can also let us know directly if they want a picture of their child removed from Instagram. Once our child's image is posted on social media, it is data, and we have to think about it like data. Ariel Reshev, thank you. A dramatic twist in the case of Russian teen ice skater Camilla Valieva, who was allowed to compete despite testing positive for a banned substance. The event she was favored to win turned into a disastrous and emotional performance. ABC's Marcus Moore has the story from Beijing. Tonight, a crushing Olympic defeat for Russia's Kamila Valieva, the 15-year-old phenom at the center of a doping scandal, failing to medal in the women's free skate. Valieva entering the day in first place, but committing multiple errors, falling twice and finishing fourth in a stunning upset. You were watching a young, young girl just really unravel and fall apart before our eyes. You wanted to turn away. Tensions high in the arena, days after an international court allowed Valieva to skate despite a positive test from December for a banned heart drug that can boost endurance. With Valieva not placing in the top three, the IOC allowing the award ceremony to go forward, two of her teammates and a Japanese skater instead taking the podium. All of this coming as the New York Times and the Associated Press report that two other medications used to improve heart and muscle function were declared on Valieva's anti-doping control form. Both are legal. 
Marcus joins us now from Beijing. Marcus, no one competing in events where Valieva placed are able to get medals until an investigation into that positive doping test is completed. Are Olympic officials doing anything in place of medals for now? Yeah, they are, Phil, and this is a, really an extraordinary situation, and we know that from uh, officials here in Beijing, they actually plan to give Team USA, for example, who secured the silver medal in the team skating event, they plan to give them Olympic torches in place of the medals until this situation is resolved. But, Phil, certainly there are so many questions, more questions than, that, than answers right now about how this is going to end. Phil. Right, not at all what a silver medalist wants to get. All right, Marcus, thank you. And still to come, the jump in COVID cases in Hong Kong in recent weeks. What's driving that rise? And we're going to take you to our nation's southern border where migrants continue to arrive as immigration policies begun under former President Trump remain in place today. We'll be right back. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. She was diva, drama, money and fame, shop amazing, the prime housewife. Then suddenly, we've seen a lot of things on The Real Housewives, but we've never seen anyone be arrested. Unpredictable rich woman. Sign me up. Money. This is what being live is Three all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. We are tracking several headlines around the world. <laughs> Take a look at this terrifying video. A monster wave smashing through a ferry's window in Hamburg, Germany. Passengers could be heard screaming and scrambling, as you would imagine, to evacuate the cabin. All this caused by a powerful storm in northern Germany. Thankfully, there were no reports of injuries. However, another powerful round of storms is expected to hit tomorrow. A team of several mainland Chinese health experts arrived in Hong Kong in the hopes of getting COVID infections under control. Hong Kong authorities say new cases are 60 times higher this month alone. Schools, gyms, and most public venues are shut down, and some office employees are working from home. But many residents are fatigued, as you know, by the harsh restrictions imposed to protect the city against the pandemic, even as most of the major cities in the world adjust to living with the virus. An indigenous language from Chile's extreme south has vanished after the death of its last living speaker and the guardian of its ancestral culture. Christina Calderon, who mastered the Yamana language, died at the age of 93. However, she was generous enough to save her knowledge by creating a dictionary of the language with translation into Spanish. Calderon's daughter is actually one of the representatives currently drafting Chile's new constitution and considers the dictionary a way of not only preserving, but possibly even rescuing the language. Now to our nation's southern border, where migrants continue to arrive daily in the hopes of building a life here in our country. And while President Trump's term has long ended, his immigration policies, namely Title 42 and Migrant Protection Protocols, known as MPP, continue under the Biden administration. But as our Maria Villarreal exclusively learned, things may soon change, whether or not our Border Patrol agents are ready. This is the bridge that connects Hidalgo, Texas to Reynosa, Mexico. Over the last year, it's become a path of uncertainty and fear for so many families, a stark symbol of a fractured immigration system. Less than a block from the bridge in Reynosa is a growing encampment. More than 2,200 migrants corralled into a small plaza 
thanks in large part to Title 42, a U.S. policy that allows Border Patrol to immediately remove migrants seeking asylum due to health concerns related to the pandemic. It's easy for visitors like us to get lost in the sea of tents, clothes hanging everywhere, trash piling up, cooking is nearly impossible. So meals are often donated by churches in the U.S. But hidden among the chaos is a small slice of normalcy. We blurred the faces of these children for their protection. So this is the sidewalk school. <laughs> I just got here. Hi. The Sidewalk School is an American nonprofit organization that runs solely on donations. We had to go at a very rapid pace. We, we do fund the food that goes in that camp, the socks, the clothing. That's the Sidewalk School. In there? In there. They don't know it, and that's how we like to keep it. Uh, it's just things are safer for Victor and I that way. So the partners we have, the pastors who live here, the, the shelter directors who live here, you see them give out everything, which is great. You just don't know where it comes from, but it's us. There are three classes a day filled with up to 40 students from a lot of different countries. Bastante Honduras. Yeah. Oh, bastante. Quien esta de Guatemala? Okay, no, I was in the water. Um, hmm. El, El Salvador? Oh. De donde? De aquí? De Mexico? Quien está Mexico? Mexico? De Haiti. De Haiti. Oh, hola, Henry. Felicia Rangel Sampanato watches the camp grow every day. It's clear to me right now in the U.S. that people seem to think this problem has quieted. How is that perception different from reality? It never stopped under Biden. Nothing's changed. Children are still sent across unaccompanied. And let me say, this is only to minority asylum seekers. There are no white asylum seekers in this camp. And that's what people should be asking. Why is it different for white asylum seekers? Why is it only brown and black people you see living in dirt 24-7? Now for almost a year. A few miles from the plaza along the riverbank, Pastor Hector runs the Senda de Vida shelter. So most of the families are, are going to be people who have already crossed and come back. That's right. Yeah, and yeah. they don't have any more money. They ran out. Global response management helps with the medical needs. And more than half of their patients right now are from Haiti, one of the top countries of origin for black immigrants in the U.S. The country has been rattled by civil unrest and natural disasters in recent years. We're seeing an increase in Haitian migration. Like Senda was built by my pastor and whoever he works with as a more of a safe haven. But La Plaza, it is it feels like a free fall sometimes. So this is just one of two shelters in Reynosa, Mexico. There are more than 1,100 people here right now. And yet every day this place continues to grow as more people are sent back from the U.S. What are you looking for right now, though? These footprints is what we're looking for. On the U.S. side of the border, it's just as busy for federal agents. We followed along as they patrolled near the border wall. What do we know? Countries of origin, roughly? Uh, three El Salvadorans and a few Mex. And uh, what stands out a little bit is that those two individuals right there, 19-year-old, that they're from Reynosa, which is a border town in Mexico right across the, the, the river. So it's just after uh, 7, 7 in the morning, sun is just coming up. Uh, we've been with Border Patrol for a few hours now. Uh, this is probably our fourth or fifth stop. All of the guys caught in this group were previously caught a few days ago. This past December alone, there were over 78,000 Title 42 expulsions at the southwest border. But the Border Patrol's top leader, Chief Raul Ortiz, spoke to me exclusively and says he's telling his agents to prepare for possible changes. Are you in on the conversations about Title 42 and changing it, ending it? I'm not a policy maker. 
Uh, I do provide counsel when I'm asked, but uh, I really can't get, be focused on that as much as making sure that the men and women have the resources that they need out here. I know I don't have enough agents. I know I don't have enough equipment. And then I know I need to close some gates and gaps. That will put us in a better position for success. Last year, the Supreme Court blocked the Biden administration's attempt to terminate the migrant protection protocols, so the government has been gradually rolling it out again. So what you're seeing is hope that Biden takes away Title 42, which he can at any second if he chooses to. So you're talking about people hoping that Title 42 goes away, so at least they have a chance to claim, make a claim of asylum. That's what you're looking at out here. For now, families willingly wait here because they say going back to their home countries just isn't an option. Trust me, it's hard. Please keep us in mind because there are a lot of families suffering and the kids are the most vulnerable. Maria Villarreal, thank you for that exclusive look. Still to come tonight, it might be the most memorable stop he's ever had. We're going to introduce you to the UPS driver who got the birthday surprise of a lifetime from a third grade class. of our time, anytime, Nightline. There's an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime. 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by no people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back. Delivering a birthday to remember, a third grade class went all out to ring in 30 years for their favorite UPS driver. Matt Reed, with our partner station WCVB in Boston, takes us to this special surprise in our local lowdown. For the last year, UPS driver Tyler Kingsbury has known that of all the stops on his route, the deliveries to JFK Elementary and Somerville each day would be his most memorable. Tyler, Tyler, Tyler. Just about every school day has looked Get ready. Tyler's coming. and sounded like this. We love Tyler. Because of Mrs. Merrill's third grade class that enjoys snack time at the same time Tyler's truck drives by. We started to wave and honk and Eventually, we decided to try to find out more about him. We would all like count down to like three and we'd all scream the same thing. How old am I? What's my favorite color? Um, when's my birthday? And once the students learned Tyler's 30th birthday was coming up last week, the kids knew they had to throw him a surprise birthday party. I pulled into the parking lot and all the kids were here lined up. They all made um, signs that said, happy 30th birthday, Tyler. They designed hats. They made these incredible stop action videos. Um, they gave me cupcakes, gifts, snacks. And Tyler says he was blown away not just by the gifts, but the amount of skill these students showed. We started off by thinking of doing like a happy birthday, Tyler, and then a truck with his face on it. Who made this one for me? Was it Tommy? I bet like most people in classes is at schools would like not like just throw birthday parties for random people that drive by. And the UPS symbol, that's great. But it's the fact these students did throw a party for someone they just met that made it so special for Tyler and has made this daily routine a highlight of his job. It was a moment I'll remember forever. Um, and yeah, it was just really incredible. Matt Reed from Boston tonight, thank you. And that's our show for tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks so much for streaming with us. 
And a reminder, join us tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Eastern for an ABC News Live special, Race in America, a conversation. We'll examine the state of race relations across the U.S. following the recent trials over the killing of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery. We're also going to take uh, some time to look at recent disturbing instances involving race and violence. is all about. Right.